I'll try to say something in Polish. Dzień, dzień dobry. Dzień dobry, witam państwa. Um, um, well, I'll continue in English. Oh, well, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm really honored to be in Krakow. I love coming to Krakow. I'll come anytime uh, if you ever want to have me again. Um, and it's just great to be back in Poland. I just, for some of you uh, who haven't met me yet, I actually was a student at the University of Warsaw. Um, until 1985, then I moved on, went to Germany where I studied psychology and philosophy, did my PhD uh, in the United States and stayed since the, uh, there in the United States. By, but I do come back to Poland a lot and in fact I'm very proud to say that I have this kind of a very minor position at the Warsaw School of Social Psychology and I'm officially the boss of Ed Nenska, <laughs> which is funny in multiple ways. Uh, only talk to people who know the Polish system. <laughs> anyway, this is just an inside joke. Uh, so I'm really uh, happy to be talking about uh, my work here because it is really relevant uh, to all the strands of, that have been discussed so far, maybe, maybe except for sophisticated legal questions. And uh, my work comes from a perspective of a social psychologist. So I was trained as a social psychologist. I call myself a social psychologist. And I'm ultimately interested in questions uh, of understanding how we process, respond to, under, uh, understand social stimuli. And the stimuli and, our, and responses can be of very different kinds. So here we have, um, can you hear me if I move? Or do I need a, can you hear me? Is that okay? So here we have uh, um, Frau Merkel uh, exchanging pleasant glances or unpleasant glances with the French president. Uh, we, here we have uh, the reactions of Romney and his uh, vice presidents after the outcome of the election. Here we have the Polish uh, famous ad. Here we have some animal behavior. And you can see that uh, in all these pictures that there are um, we see examples of imitation, we see examples of emotional responses, we see examples of emotion being uh, used to persuade, to sell, and also to, to communicate. So I'm trying to understand how these things work, uh, both on the psychological level, on the level of brain and, and physiology. And I take a particular empirical perspective that is extremely familiar to some of you, not at all familiar to of you, so I'll do a bad job for both audiences, but I'll, 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 I'll simplify for those, for the experts, and I might complicate it too much for non-experts. But this perspective is called embodied cognition, or grounded cognition. And um, this perspective arose uh, from uh, kind of a disagreement with this more symbolic, kind of formal-based uh, notion of social cognition where, or cognition in general, where we process stimuli just as a kind of disembodied abstract representation. And as alternative, the, the, the idea is that uh, processing uh, cognitive, emotional, social processing is based on embodied model mechanisms. So what does this actually mean? So I have a very crude demonstration or example of, of, of what this means. Uh, just think about, you know, uh, a lemon, okay? This is a fruit. You can grab it. You can look at it. You can taste it. You can squeeze it. You can put it on your tongue, uh, get some juice out of the lemon. Okay, and let's say now I'll ask you a question about some cognitive property of a lemon. So what is kind of like a, a first property of, of a lemon that comes to your mind? Say it in Polish or in English or in German. Sour. Okay, great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So you have just now demonstrated the idea of embodied cognition. So the notion is that uh, on the tr formal standard models of processing, uh, you retrieve this property sour from your lexicon of uh, properties that are associated with the concept of the lemon, just like you uh, think about a bird and the property that comes is wings or eggs, things like that. But the embodied cognition uh, hypothesis says that uh, uh, when you, we, you think uh, about lemons, people, actions, everything, you utilize uh, re resources, somatosensory resources, and especially resources that have been involved in perception and action of, of an object. So particularly when you 
th thought about things that can be done with the lemon and you thought about how the lemon tastes, the word, uh, the, the property sour, you've experienced the sourness. Some of you have may, may have even salivated, at least I salivate when I talk about, even talk about lemons. So, and, and that information informs your cognitive responses. So they not just look up tables of associative uh, uh, connections, they are, cognitive responses are uh, grounded in, these, in the perceptual experiences. So, so if we do it for lemons, and we do it for hammers, and if we do it for uh, perception of chairs, we certainly do it for people, right? Social cognition is certainly embodied, and emotional cognition should certainly be embodied, an insight that has been in, expressed in psychology in various ways for, 100, for over a hundred years, and since William James. What the modern embodied cognition perspective uh, brings to it is the idea that there are per very particular mechanisms that are brain-based rather than necessarily uh, bodily-based, and we can figure out finally how, how it works. So uh, just to give one more example, let's say I'm asking you about this man, Obama, um, and I can ask you about what is his expression, uh, is he competent, uh, do you trust him? So the idea is that you would recognize expression partly using the mechanisms that are involved in making expression yourself. Uh, a perception is partly informed by action. He has a face, we have a face. So in order to disambiguate this expression, because uh, uh, people from my friends in, from San Diego who vote Republican says that this, is, this expression is not hope, but it's professorial disdain. Right, so it's a, it's, it's, or, or it's a haughty arrogance demonstrated by Obama. Um, so, but you, we, we partly how we try to disambiguous is by uh, getting facial feedback, and of course we can get feedback from our uh, internal states. So this is how uh, the embodied cognition proposes that we look at at uh, social processing. Today I'll, I'll take you on a tour of uh, some of my work on embodied cognition, particularly in relation to perception and influence of facial expressions. But I'll, to, I'll try to uh, not only present kind of a standard case for embodied cognition, but I'll try to complicate it a little bit. And, and I think it's going to re be relevant for questions understanding of imitation and kind of social uh, you know, cognition in general. Because, you know, I'll, I'll show you that to some extent a lot of embodied processes are uh, in a way dumb. They just basically reflect associative connections with, between perception and action. You see a face, you make a face, just because every time you smile, you probably saw a smile. Every time you stretch out a hand, you probably saw an outstretched hand. So there's tons of perception action links and embodiment to some extent capitalizes on those reflexive, these, these highly associated connections between per, uh, perception and action. And these links are inflexible, automatic, encapsulate, unconscious, and, and learned. And in some, in some sense, they're dumb and, and useless, but I'll show you also in some way, and they can be actually quite useful if you uh, utilize them in a particular way. But what's uh, going to be perhaps more, more uh, or challenging or, or provocative part of the talk is that I'll also argue that you can, the embodiment can be quite clever and that uh, embodied processes can, can work dynamically with higher order representations and can be quite context uh, specific. So they can, and what you embody and how you embody is meaning dependent, it's flexible and conditional and it's socially situated. So in some sense, if you look at this picture here, we are uh, puppets on the embodied string or embodied puppets on a string, but we can uh, move the strings along and we can become free. And I'll show you how that works. Um, so um, I'll start with uh, talking about facial expressions uh, and their, their, their impact, and then I'll move on uh, uh, bodily expressions. So there will be a, a facial imitation and fa facial decision part to the talk, and then the bodily imitation and, and bodily decision part of the talk. And uh, I come from the United States. I work in the United States, so I can't do any talk. I moved on beyond cartoons. Now it's time for a, a YouTube clip, uh, a necessary part of any talk uh, of someone who comes in the state. So, uh, and I pre prepared, uh, prepared for you a very refined cultural experience.
I see Professor Nenska kind of shaking his leg. At <laughs> okay, so I'll spare you the rest of this. Um, but, you know, you get a sense that, you know, these uh, imitative uh, responses are quite... Um, It's always a problem with videos, um, are, are really uh, come on very early ontho uh, ontologically. Um, so this was a, um, a, a baby that's a year and a half. And we know in some sense this from this slightly, co well, controversial work of early uh, melts of on newborns because only one of those imitation strategies has been, have been actually uh, uh, replicated, but we know, and anyone who has a baby uh, knows that these imitation strategies come in, uh, come in very early. And so how clever are they? So how dumb they are they? And how dependent are they actually on understanding of the other minds? Are they actually related to, any, uh, to, mental, to mentalizing? So there is a way, actually, this is an important question because it bears on, the, on uh, debate to what extent imitation per se is sufficient for transmitting uh, higher uh, com components of culture, as we uh, had uh, exclusively discussed in, in uh, uh, talk by Professor Kowaleski, right? Uh, yes, your talk, and then in uh, talk yesterday by Bartosz. Okay, so, um, so uh, one way to answer these questions is to uh, look whether people imitate objects that are literally dumb and automatic. And we have an object like this, and this object is called uh, an android. So we have this individuum, well, uh, this head in our lab, and this is uh, one of the many robots produced now by Handsome Robotics. You can actually buy it for $20,000, and it comes with uh, this intricate machinery inside that allows the robot to move its face uh, making uh, facial expressions. Uh, and you can train the robot, it's all fully controllable to make all Ekman style facial expressions. So make it smile, make it frown, make it um, um, show surprise, move his eyes, move his brow, brows. I'll show you a little mo movie about how the robot works, uh, just so you get a better sense. robot, an emotionally intelligent machine modeled after the famed physicist, can track your eye movements, respond to audio cues, and mimic your facial expressions, much like a real human. The head and shoulders automaton was built at Hanson Robotics in Texas, and it uses 31 internal motors to evoke expressions of happiness, sadness, anger, fear, or confusion. But what makes Einstein seem so human is its software, developed by scientists in the Machine Perception Laboratory at the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology at UC San Diego. Okay, so this is... So this is our uh, Einstein, and uh, it's also if you don't get obsessed too, too much with the fact that he's Einstein, because we have robots that are also uh, dressed up as other, other individuals, so... So this replicates, whatever I'll tell you, uh, replicates with robots that don't look like Einstein. It just was more fun to, to use the Einstein in those studies. So, um, so when uh, participants are confronted with Einstein, um, they uh, probably have very similar reactions to uh, your reactions. In some sense, you kind of impress. Wow, he looks like a human. That's amazing. But it also you're creeped out or you are in an uncanny valley. Right, because you realize that this is, you know, it is really a bunch of wires just cleverly uh, con uh, connected, and you realize that these are just basically strings. He li literally is a puppet on, on a strings and, and with a few motors. So participants have this reaction uh, and, uh, of uncanniness. They, 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 they feel weird about the android, and they definitely don't believe that he has mental state, even though they believe that he looks like a human, which is, which, which is correct. So this is an interesting case from the perspective of embodied studying uh, these reactions, because you have uh, participants who believe that the object is non-intentional, it's mechanical, but it extre has extremely high fidelity to the human thing. So he should uh, evoke imitative reactions if imitation is really just about processing a similarity between your body and an other body. But if imitation has to do with an intentional link, 
to the other participants, there should be no imitation, right? So a robot is an interesting case to do these, to these types of studies. So, so we uh, uh, run a, a, a study using uh, Einstein uh, who was either smiling or frowning and we recorded participants' responses using facial EMG. Uh, let me just tell you very briefly, for those of you who don't know what facial EMG is, because I'm going to be using it a lot, it's a technique that relies on measuring muscle. Uh, it's very inexpensive. You can get the system for $4,000. Uh, you place electrodes on the zygomaticus muscle, which just basically means the muscle that uh, makes you smile, or the corrugator muscle, the muscle that makes you frown, and you get these wiggly waves, and you can measure the amplitude of these waves and um, frequency, various parameters. But basically, the more it wiggles, the bigger the underlying muscle responses. And these, this is a proxy, of course, for uh, measuring the brain uh, imitative responses. And you can show that EMG can pick up signals even when you don't uh, overtly imitate. So if, uh, even if your face is still, you can still pick up EMG activity. So this is a, a very nice um, uh, technique. So, and one of the nice things that also EMG allows us to do is uh, it allows us to computationally link uh, the, the model, the robot, uh, the, the, the generator of the signal, to the participant. So we can uh, link the servo to the muscle, and we can do all sorts of fancy statistics looking at the degree of synchronization. Okay, so what happens in the study? The study is incredibly simple. You, you come into the lab and you're just doing two conditions. This is the, these are standard uh, paradigm for studying facial imitation. You just watch the robot first, so you just observe Einstein. You're not told to do anything. You're just told, you just observe. Um, so this is the observation condition, and this condition will pick up whether people do spontaneous mimicry. And then the other condition, we do active mimicry. And this condition allows you to see whether, for example, uh, people generally can perceive the Einstein expressions well and whether they can uh, synchronize explicitly with, with the robot. So we have the facial EMG and Android servo activity. And the results are extremely simple. They look complicated, but they're actually extremely simple. So I'm going to come here um, and show you that this graph shows um, uh, uh, data uh, that focus on the corrugator on frowning. Um, so these are uh, responses from the robot. So this is Einstein's brow server activity. You can see that it, com it comes on uh, in the first second, stays on for about a second and a half, and it goes off. Okay, so it's very kind of punctate. And here you can see the human, spontaneous activity of a human, and this is the voluntary activity of the human. You can see that the spontaneous activity is weaker. It's actually 10 times weaker than intentional activity. But you can, most importantly, see that it's almost perfectly matched, both in terms of timing and in terms of the signal envelope. So people do spontaneously imitate Einstein. Uh, they do it uh, with the same speed and with the same accuracy fidelity as they do it in um, in an intentional condition. So this is a very, very um, uh, beautiful result in the sense it's just very clean, showing that even without any knowledge of in intentionality, you uh, spontaneously will match to a, a facial expression. And the same is true for the zygomaticus muscle, but I'm just gonna, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna skip it. But people also synchronize on the zygomaticus. So, so this is just a, a first study that shows facial mimicry is kind of dumb and, auto, and automatic. So we have this chameleon, um, you know, consistent with this idea that we are chameleons. But, you know, the question is then, you know, how dumb is it? So, that, so you know, because if you're seeing a robot, you can obviously have all sorts of other thoughts. You may be not thinking about what you're supposed to imitate, but you can analyze, you know, the... the the, the larger context, social context, and this might be triggering you to engage imitation responses. So one question is to whether you can trigger these imitation responses even with stimuli that are unconscious, or, and you can ask yourself a question whether these imitation-like responses are penetrable or do we have access to these imitations? So I put these two words for philosophers because they like complicated words and when I used to study theory of mind in Germany, I would use words like, and the question is whether uh, the process is encapsulated or it's cognitively penetrable, right? 
And uh, if you don't like fancy words, uh, you can uh, think about Celine Dion's song, uh, where she says that she can see with her heart, right? You know, if you can see something with your heart, that means that you have subjective, introspective access to uh, processes that might elude your conscious perception, but have some bodily manifestations. And if you want one more metaphor, you can think about uh, Yoda telling Luke to use the force. Close your eyes, he puts a blind on, over his eyes and just tells him, you can shoot these, you know, you can fight these bullets uh, just using the force. So can we use that force, that, that force that's created by, by our imitative reactions? So how do we test this? Well, we can use a very brief presentation. So we flash stimuli uh, at a threshold of conscious detection. So this is, would be one-tenth of a millisecond. Uh, sorry, uh, 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds. We actually had two conditions. I'm just going to collapse them for you. So you have a very brief expression, which is anger, which is then masked. It can be either masked with a neutral face or with a... Uh, uh, dot mask, it also doesn't matter. Uh, but the goal in, of your task is to detect whether the face is, uh, what is the, uh, whether it's an emotional face. So you could be asked whether this face was uh, neutral or angry, or uh, in another block, there would be faces that, that are happy or neutral. So your detection, it's a very simple kind of force choice detection task. Happy, uh, neutral, or angry, neutral. Okay? So that's what you do. While you're doing this, while you're trying to see with your heart, you know, these very, very briefly flashed faces, we monitor again your body just to see whether there is a bodily signal. And we're going to try to link uh, to see whether there is any effect in, in, in the bodily responses and, in, and how it links to, to choices. So first of all, you can see this is again uh, an EMG plot that if you just look at frowning, uh, there is a very robust uh, EM, EMG signal such that angry faces produce more frowning than happy faces. And that is uh, uh, even though these faces are subliminal. This is just a replication of other people who have done that work, so Dimberg, so, uh, so, but this is a very nice kind of robust uh, way of, of looking that there is a bodily response to these faces. How do you test the penetrability, penetrability hypothesis? Well, we played Yoda or Celine Dion, and we told some people that, uh, well, uh, they can succeed uh, by just focusing uh, hard and the, trying to detect subtle changes in the picture, so we call it the look strategy of detection, or we gave people, so this is the Yoda strategy, the feel strategy of detection. We asked them, you know, you could actually do better in this task. You're gonna do very badly. You're just go, gonna barely be able to do it above chance. But you could do better if you listen to your uh, feelings. The feelings could be in the changes in your phenomenal state, or they could be changes in your body, including subtle twitches in the face. Use those, you know, if you use those, you can do better. And, and we have a control condition. And this is a null result, so this is, this is a graph about nothing. Uh, well, no difference between conditions. You can see that people do slightly above chance, the chance would be 50%, uh, but they are, uh, uh, they are not better using their feel strategy uh, than uh, using the look strategy or not using strategy in a, at all. So even though they focus on the body, uh, they didn't, uh, this didn't help them. You know, I always have some Zen master in the audience and he says, well, my Zen students will do better. And we're exploring this actually using meditative t techniques right now and we haven't seen much evidence that this, this is actually helping you with the task. Uh, but, um, but one, I don't have a graph for this, but I'll just tell you if you're interested in, that we did a classifier analysis. So we basically took the physiological uh, signal and we tr predicted how well can you do if you just take the EMG wave and use it to classify whether the face was happy or neutral or angry or neutral. And you can, do, uh, you can go up to 70%. So your body does better than you. Your body has wisdom that you don't know. You know much more than you actually know. Well, your body knows much more than you actually know. So the problem is we, can, we somehow don't have access to these bodily responses. But maybe there are, it, there are ways to make them, make them subjectively ac accessible. All right, so, so, but are these reactions, are these facial responses actually doing something? Uh, there's way, various ways of, uh, of testing this question, looking at this question. 
I'm particularly interested, and I know you are interested, in the impact of these emotional stimuli on decision making. The reason why we're interested in this is uh, not only because uh, Walmart, McDonald's, and in Poland, car rental companies and uh, use smileys, you know, um, you can also get paid quite a lot of money by consulting, which involves putting smileys on things. So, so in America, they improve uh, sales of fish, the fish cracker, uh, golden crackers by putting a smiley on the fish. So, the, so these types of stimuli are used in, in strategies. So we tested basically whether you can make people uh, gamble more by just flashing them subliminal smiles. Uh, and these blondes, blondes probably believe that they can make this man gamble more when flashing a smile. Um, so we used something called a myopic gambling paradigm that actually has been used in some work on uh, patients with ventral medial prefrontal uh, cortex. And it's, it sounds complicated, but it's actually an unbelievably simple task. You are giving uh, an endowment, uh, $20 in that particular case, and then you gonna, uh, with help participants, they're going to do uh, 50 gambling trials. Um, and on each trial, they will be faced with a very simple decision. They can uh, either uh, uh, basically uh, take a uh, uh, just uh, take a dollar from um, from the uh, their bank account and gamble it, and they have a 50% chance of winning additional 150. So this they would end up with 250, or a, f a 50 chance of losing. Uh, one dollar. So the expected value is 125. Or they can just pass, they can just say I don't want to play uh, gamble on the trial and they can just move on to the next trial. So if you basically pass all the trials you're gonna end up uh, keeping your twenty dollars, uh, twenty dollars but if you gamble uh, you're gonna lose an, on some trial, win on other trials uh, but you're gonna end up with more money if you gamble. So you should be actually gamble, gambling all the time. So are people gambling, and when are they gambling? Well, uh, we tested this by giving people uh, uh, this pass and invest decision and uh, uh, asking them, uh, telling them that there are going to be some faces, they're going to look neutral, and they just have to make a decision whether the face is male or female. Huh. But little do they know that there are actually primes which are either happy, neutral, or angry faces uh, that are, this is basically a pretext to have a mask and to, to explain somehow the presence of, of, of a face. And then uh, you can make these uh, past and investment decisions. So, and people uh, do gamble more after happy faces. You can see the fact is, you know, looks statistically, you know, it's statistically significant and looks big because I've blown up this difference, but it's, it's about 3% effects. Uh, which is consistent with other studies on, on emotional influence on gambling. I don't know what, whether you're going to have bigger effects, but we never moved beyond the magic 5% difference. Uh, the nice thing about this is that that does survive, uh, you know, standard kind of economic type of, uh, of considerations. And if you actually uh, give people money, they do the same thing. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not just uh, uh, for fun. It's just not for, for points. So it suggests that these, are, uh, these, these uh, emotions from faces are influencing uh, gambling decision. And maybe I, I'll just mention this, uh, that this is, um, we've done a neuroimaging study actually, although uh, the version on faces do, didn't work on this, so we had to use sex. So just bec because this is, you have some members of the Catholic institution here, I will not describe our vivid, incredibly interesting, fascinating, titillating sex study. You can, but you can re read it. It's uh, it's been it's it's out. Um, I'm just going to summarize so far uh, what I've said so far, saying that, you know, so so far I'm just showing you the dumb the dumb version of embodiment. So just telling you that you know people uh, imitate these unconscious emotional stimuli, so they match the, the valence. Uh, they uh, these uh, manipulations seem to not produce conscious feeling. They seem to be. Uh, in the basement of the mind, encapsulated, yet still they influence basic decision. And they probably involve these very kind of low-level uh, roots. So there is some work on uh, differences between voluntary smiling and spontaneous uh, smiling. And basically the spontaneous smiling may actually involve more kind of processes that are uh, just kind of, you know, around the brainstem. People like to call it a direct pathway to, to, to smiling. So this is, this is just a very th simple perception action type of mechanism. So if it's a simple perception action mechanism, and it's dumb, 
and it's just response to contingency, is it even worth talking about? Why is it actually worth you know, bothering smart people like you with these types of uh, findings, you know, except that they're kind of cute? Well, it turns out that you know, the embodied cognition uh, idea actually uh, suggests that per perception action links not only uh, produce spontaneous bodily responses when you are uh, you know, dealing with you know, uh, highly associated perception, but also that these bodily in 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 responses can be informative, can help perception, can, uh, can be useful. So, uh, so y this, this idea that these responses are, are, are actually conditional or are essentially involving perception has been shown in studies uh, using TMS, where uh, TMSing the area, the, the, the face area, will lower the perception. There, are, there is now the whole library of Botox studies showing that if you have a Botox operation, you look better, but your pa pa facial recognition ability uh, will decline. There is a study using pens, and there is even a provocative paper sh showing that if you give a child a pacifier, you know, if a male child, child a pacifier, that's blocking his responses to uh, facial expressions, you actually, the, the child would actually end up having a worse face recognition ability, right? And the idea that, that the child doesn't, doesn't develop that, per, that perception action loop or the action perception loop. But you know, the part that I'm interested in, and I'm just gonna explain this graph to you, that, that to me is fascinating, is that, that you can actually train action and benefit perception. So we have a study uh, with a group of people who are mostly interested in autism and face perception that involve a, a very simple paradigm in which participants play a game uh, where uh, this avatar appears on the screen and they have to basically uh, imitate this avatar. So you can see this avatar is extremely simple. He, all he does is just smiles and, and frowns and participants just in response to this avatar make a smile and frown. And uh, they just basically play this game and there is a control condition. So you basically do a lot of perception action associations. So you do 150 of those. And what it turns out is that uh, if you test uh, participants on their ability to recognize emotions from dynamic faces, those groups that uh, were exposed to the training and actually were correctly uh, performing these actions uh, have later better face recognition ability. That is, by imitating, by dumbly imitating, just by doing a smile to a smile, you can actually improve your recognition of smiles. Why is that, re why is that relevant? Because, <clears throat> because there are all sorts of disorders, in the most the, uh, uh, famous one being autism, that are associated with face recognition deficits. And it has been, uh, and often parents buy these games that focus, uh, teach children to discriminate facial expression from one another, and they all based on visual strategies, on, on this is all visual practice. But here what we've shown is that really if you can just by learning to imitate facial expressions, you can inc improve uh, facial recognition. So there is an alternative path to perception, to improvement of perception, that is through, to, through motor training. And that's something, and it also shows that these embodiment theories can actually lead to, to interventions that, that are uh, useful. Um, okay, so, so this is now, this was the part about the dumb emb uh, embodiment, and in the last 10 minutes that I have left, I want to tell you um, about how this was all wrong. Well, not wrong in a sense, in empirical sense, but in a sense conceptually, that this, this kind of dumb embodiment framework is a bad way to thinking about uh, actually uh, how, what goes on in, in real social interactions. So I call this part a clever chameleon. And I'm just gonna start with a very intuitive example. So these are my friends in San Diego. I, there's not much to do, it's very, you know, it's a, weather is nice in California, but the, the city is spread out, so I, I end up playing bridge with these, these nice ladies, right? So uh, in bridge and other games, um, you have lots of facial expressions. These ladies don't lie with their faces. They're bad poker players. They wouldn't, they, their, their facial expressions are accurate, uh, correct, reflect the state. But so, from the embodiment perspective, okay, if this woman sees this woman uh, smiling, then she should just smile and she should have all these positive impact on her behavior. She should make bigger gambles. But so, sh so sh should she 
do when she sees this woman smile. But if you know the bridge, the complicated rules of the bridge, you realize that they are on the same team, so her smile actually means something different than her smile. Because if she's smiling, that means that she has good cards, right? So, so this is a coalition partner that, that telling you something positive. And if she's smiling, she also says that she has good cards, but that's, that the meaning of the smile is dramatically different, right? Okay, so if you see your arch enemy smile, don't smile back because that probably means something bad for you. Right, so this is a perfect example to look at uh, a contrast the, the actually imperceptual input and the meaning of the input. So that's what we did uh, using our robot and, um, and there are other studies using um, also hand imitations uh, from Celia Hayes lab that use a similar uh, logic. But the logic is very straightforward. You're playing a gambling game, uh, so you, um, uh, there are uh, dice being thrown, and you don't know the outcome of, uh, of the throw. So you know, uh, but uh, the robot knows. So the robot is gonna smile, or it's gonna frown, in response to, the, uh, to what he learns about uh, the dice. Okay, and in one condition, uh, you are with Einstein, so, uh, so you can look at his face to see if he won for your team or whether he uh, lost, for your, uh, lost for your team. But there's also a uh, competitive condition, right, in which you are actually on a different team than Einstein. So you can look at his face to see whether uh, Einstein beat you or uh, whether he, he lost to you. So in that case, if you're seeing Einstein smile, that means that he beat you, and if you see his frown, that means that he lost for you. Okay, does it make sense? It's not very complicated, but sometimes um, I don't do a good job explaining this. Okay, so we have, these, uh, uh, we have this uh, face information condition, and we also have a condition where we just give people the same information using uh, text. Basically, just, it's just pure kind of disembodied. So I'm not gonna uh, elaborate on this, but I'm just gonna, uh, but this is important to, to, for maintaining the embodied interpretation. But basically, I'm gonna tell you what happens is that uh, basically facial responses in this task are de determined by the meaning. The meaning beats the, uh, the matching, the, the, percept the perceptual matching. How do we know it? We know it because when Einstein smiles and you're in a uh, cooperative condition, you have that response from your zygomaticus, so you smile, okay? But you also have that response, that red line uh, that goes up from zero, so you smile when Einstein frowns and you're in the uh, uh, competitive condition. That is, you smile as much to Einstein's smile uh, as you s smile to his frown if the, if the coalition is changed, right? So, so we don't imitate in this condition. Imitation goes out of the window. So your embodied response is determined by the meaning of that, uh, of, of that, of that stimulus. It's still, the blue line represents when you, the same information is presented context, uh, just using text, and you can see that there's ver there are very low in terms of bodily responses. Um, so, so in order to move your body, it's the meaning that moves your body. It's not the perception uh, uh, action uh, match. Okay. Um, you know, if this, if you uh, getting tired of the robot, and if you want something more social, uh, because um, we uh, we've done uh, this using probably as social, well, at least in the lab, as social uh, question as possible. And that is uh, basically creating the same situ situation by manipulating uh, power. Power, you know, verticality, uh, hierarchical relation between people is a critical uh, part of social relationship. And as you probably imagine, spontaneously, it's very important uh, for imitation to know who you, uh, who mo your model is, because if you know, Adek is uh, touching his nose, I'm of course going to be touching my nose, because I want to be in his good graces, but if some person I don't like touches his nose, I'm not necessarily gonna do it, so uh, uh, we know it. So we use this hierarchical verticality here, uh, very uh, sophisticatedly displayed by a cartoon. And you can, you can see it actually, you know, during the last election uh, campaign when uh, there were debates between uh, Obama and Romney and there were vice presidential deba debates and there, were, and there were also these cross situations where Omni Romney was in interacting with Biden and, um, 
and, uh, and with Paul. So, uh, so we basically created uh, differences in social power by having participants think about time where they felt in control of things and they had leadership over a group of people and, and a condition when they had low power. So we, do, uh, we manipulate power that way. And we also tell them something about the, the model itself, so the, the stimulus that they're going to watch. So we tell them that this is going to be either someone who is, well, give them information that this is Mark, grocery store stalker, not a high status position, or this would be John uh, Ednenska, the head of experimental psychology at the University, Jagiellonian University. Or, well, we use the CEO uh, thing, but it's equivalent. Uh, <clears throat> I think I'm getting tired of my <laughs> jokes. Uh, so, um, and we measure corrugator and zygomaticus activity. Okay, so I'll, these are somewhat complicated results, but I'm just going to simplify them. And, and if you're interested in a paper, I'm happy to send it. Basically, if you look at frowning, you get, a, you get straight imitation. Whether you basically you frown more to, to, to frowns and, uh, than to uh, smiles. And you do it regardless whether uh, the... Uh, the, the model is a high status person or low status person. And your own personal power doesn't matter. So the frowning is actually driven by these straight imitative responses, which is interesting, actually. Okay, it's the smiling where uh, complications uh, arise or com complexity uh, ensues. So, so if you just look at a control group, you know, s uh, standard story, people smile more to uh, a happy target, uh, and uh, this is regardless whether there's high status or, or low status. And, uh, but now, if you look at uh, when people see a high status target and they feel high power, then things change. You actually smile more to an angry target. And I'm just going to just trust, this is a rich interpretation, but I believe that this is correct. So basically, if you feel powerful, you know, you, you are the boss, you, uh, you are one mafia boss, uh, and you encountering another mafia boss, and he's angry at you, what are you going to flash at him? A smile, right? It's basically, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a status contest, right? So imitation flies out of the window. No more imitation when you have a competition in, competition in, in status, right? Uh, uh, you only smile to, to the high status person if you feel low, low powerful. That's when you smile to the high status thing. But if yourself you feel high, uh, 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 if both people are high uh, in status, then, then, then you have these competitive responses. And imitation also goes out of the window when you're dealing with in a low power state. And I would say that interpretation here is a little bit different. So here basically we're seeing more smiling to uh, 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 a low st uh, by, um, to a low status target by a low status, uh, sorry. So we see here uh, more smiling to a frown uh, by uh, uh, a low status target. And I think this can, this can be probably something like a consolation smile on one of those smiles that has to do with appeasement. So there's all sorts of interpretation to this. So I'm, I'm giving you a rich interpretation, but, but many people uh, believe that you, one way smiles are used is to appease in, a, in a, uh, a situation. So, so if you see this guy being angry, you're going to smile in order to try to appease. Okay, so this is very complicated, but fortunately we're getting close to the end and there's just one, uh-huh, five minutes. Uh, uh, but this complication allows me to bring in one more sophistic, one level of sophistication to, 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 to the problem of imitation. Um, and um, uh, so, so far, so I've shown you so far that, uh, that you know, this just pure reactions in, and reflect the meaning of the information, not just valence, and, you know, it's very con con context sensitive. But, but in some sense, there, is, um, there was no connection there here to kind of sophisticated social cognition. These were just bodily responses. These were not sophisticated social decisions. And so far, we didn't say any, I didn't say anything about you know, the, the meaning in a sense of intentionality of, of this. And this is one of the more interesting questions. <laughs> and this is an interesting question because for imitation, um, 
there is this assumption that that it's always that it's going to have positive social effect. You know, always you, it's good to imitate. You you're basically going to benefit from imitation, as we heard yesterday, because not only it's a good way to learn culture, but it's also um, a, a way to uh, you know kiss up to the group, basically. So people who imitate, uh, you know, get higher uh, ratings on liking, belonging, similarity, pro-sociality. So you should imitate. If you don't imitate, you're probably autistic, or you're socially awkward, or you should be socially avoided. You know, and if you go on the internet, you get these posters like, imitation is the best form of flattery with cute cats. But, as our biologist friends <laughs> tell us, Imitation is not always the, the smart social strategy, right? So here we have a Lemming University in, in San Diego, a place with lots of cliffs, and here we have them imitate each other. And here is a bunch of Elvises. I, yeah, I let you to, uh, comment on the why, uh, wisdom of that imitation. And here is someone who is imitating Tupac, uh, Tupac Shakur. And you see, you can see the cleverness of the imitation or lack of imitation, even with uh, in, in children that are twen uh, 14 months old. So this is just a study that I'll remind you of because you must, uh, you, most of you know this study, is that when you hear, when you, when a child sees an experimenter performing an action, so in this case, an action of turning a head, turning a light, the child will not always imitate that action. In fact. It will only imitate that action in one condition <coughs> when the experiment had the option of doing the action with a hand, right? So if you're do, doing this weird thing, and I'm going to do this, and you see, see me doing this, you're only going to imitate it uh, if I actually had my hands, uh, hands busy. Uh, uh, hands, your hands open. If, you, if the hands were busy, the children would imitate with their hands. So they will not do direct imitation. Okay, so this becomes important, this becomes uh, critical in social context when you're trying to understand the meaning of other people's action and you, what you're supposed to do. And this is critical in situations where you, w whenever you have observation of imitation. So, uh, so you have a situation here where a child is observing parents. Uh, here, Obama is observing the interaction between these, uh, his advisors, and here there is a job interview when a candidate is being, uh, being interviewed by two people. So we call it the third party observation paradigm, okay? So the subject observes an interaction between, between, uh, between uh, two people, okay? And these people can be imitating or not imitating. The question is then, will imitation be beneficial for the person that uh, is being observed. Beneficial in the sense of, of people trusting, uh, trusting you more. Why wouldn't it be? Well, it wouldn't be if, for example, the model has negative traits. Because if you imitate a model uh, and the model is, has negative traits, then the fact that you imitate the model is actually going to reflect negative traits on you. So basically, we did a, an experiment with uh, philosopher Patricia Churchland, uh, basically showing that uh, in a paradigm where participants observe an interaction between two individuals, and they have information about this person being a negative model, uh, and they watch uh, basically this, the, this, uh, this interviewee, so this is the person you're judging, either imitate or don't imitate, you uh, see uh, basically a big cost for mimicry. So the bottom line is, if you mimic a person, okay, and the person is, is, a, you, is a bad person, that is, person is rude and condescending, then actually your rating of trust and social competence plummet. Uh, you worse off than if you don't, uh, if you don't imitate. Right? It makes sense, right? You know, if you, if you, if you see someone, a child, imitating uh, a bully or someone, a dumb, other dumb kid, uh, you're going to rate this child as stupider than a child that does not imitate. So lack of imitation is often a signal of social competence. Okay? Uh, why, does it, why does it matter? This is, uh, um, I'm just going to finish off here. Because there we have millions of social situations in which actually we have imitation signals 
And we have, uh, in most social situations, we not only have a signal whether someone imitates, but what is the social context of that imitation. If you watch an interaction like this, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, kids uh, giving each other Hitler's gruss, you want to know what's going on, right? These are English boys giving Hitler gruss to German boys. But if you, if you know, for example, that this, uh, these German boys don't know what the Hitler gruss means, or the English boys don't know what the Hitler uh, gruss means, or if they, you know that this is done for social politeness, or if you know that this is basically a, 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 a conscious decision, that they actually know what it means and, and they're doing this because they agree, the meaning of the imitation becomes, uh, becomes completely different. So that's why I wanted to finish on this because I, wanna, I, I wanted to say that, you know, it, it's nice to have these simple stories and, and, and talk about just like often people like to present about imitation being this very positive social strategy. But you, it, it doesn't work without having um, a social uh, considerations of the social, uh, social context. So, so there are dumb processes in, in imitation and um, um, emb embodiedness and they work, and you can fire off these perception action links, you can train them, you can use them for various things, you can improve perception with them, you can exploit them in various ways. But the moment you bring in meaning, you bring in social context, you'll see that, uh, that uh, the social decisions, social judgments, and social behavior is really driven by this situated imitation, by the situated embodiment, and our bodies are never free from our larger conceptual structures. Okay, and sorry, I. I think I went two minutes over time, but I hope you excuse me. And thank you so much for your attention. Okay, uh, we are uh, running a little bit late, but maybe one or two quick questions, and then maybe we can discuss uh, more questions if you have during the coffee break. Is that okay? So any uh, quick questions? Uh, you say that some of these uh, reactions, uh, reactions are reflexive, uh, automatic, mm -hmm. and then also uh, add uh, that can be gated somehow by the social context. Uh, from how do you explain this, uh, this, 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 this different behavior? I mean, it, from a, from from a, from a narrow point right, of view, is, it's yeah, not so yeah. simple. You so know, this is a wonderful question because it also re relates to the question of of control and meaning. So there, is, there are different takes on this. So, so some people like to say that, well, if you're smiling at me, and, but I know that you're my enemy, I have this, gonna have this continuous smile res response, which I'm gonna have to suppress, and then I will have to create an alternative response based on what I believe, you know, uh, this thing. So this is the, called the suppression model, right? And some people try to spend a lot of time working on the suppression model. But there's an alternative model in which just like uh, that attention and meaning can enter very deep, you know, very early in the, in, the per, in, the, in the system. So when I see you smile, but I know that this smile means something negative, it's basically processed uh, as a negative expression. And you actually never see this tug of war. We actually never seen in the EMG these evidence for these early kind of uh, spontaneous kind of imitative responses and then the overriding role of the, the meaning. So from the, so people who work on um, emotional regulation, so like Kevin Oxner would be one person, you know, would talk about appraisal at the very, very early stage, reappraisal at the very early perceptual stage where you can show even people a very negative picture and they will not show negative responses because the, the meaning uh, uh, changes the, the whole processing stream. Well, uh, three uh, according to your initial questions, uh, the two last questions are, uh, to my opinion, uh, the same question because judgments and decisions are the links of cause-effect chain which uh, ends with uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, Next, I, I don't agree with your uh, division into dumb and clever mechanisms. Mm -hmm. 
uh, each mechanism uh, has its uh, function in the central nervous system. And for instance, if you uh, has uh, uh, damaged this dump mechanism, mm -hmm. in, uh, subcortical, for instance, in uh, basal ganglia, and you have to control your movements from the clever level, then it ends with Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. and this uh, clever uh, mechanism works much worse than this dump. Yeah. And uh, last, I, uh, I have to, uh, I feel forced to protest against uh, the description um, useless uh, reflex. Mm -hmm. a reflex is not very uh, sophisticated uh, motor action mm -hmm. indeed, but nevertheless it, it has its uh, significant function in the whole structure of human motor operation and not only human and animals too. And uh, it is always directed into the future, towards mm -hmm. future. So uh, it, uh, it isn't uh, useless mm -hmm. or aimless. Okay, these are great, great questions. I'll answer them quickly because um, I get lots of hints that we should be quick, but these are great questions. So the first question, whether judgment and behavior are separable. Uh, well, in my framework, I just distinguish them because, you know, I wanted to say, uh, allow to talk about like facial behavior, like facial mimicry as being kind of pre-judgmental. So, so it's almost like, you know, like when I scratch my nose and you scratch your nose, uh, these... Uh, synchrony type of behaviors, or when you know fish synchronize, I would say they don't involve judgments that I should be doing this. So I just wanted to say, you know, that there is a category of bodily responses that maybe is kind of a, a more immediate adjustment. The thing about um, clever and dumb, you know, it's very funny that you mentioned this because you know I was. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, in various ways, I, I was involved in the system one, system two debate in psychology, kind of the idea that people make these intuitive decisions which are dumb, and then uh, it's a little bit, um, and of course, there are lots of situations in which these automatic responses or heuristic responses or these kind of, uh, uh, the less can be more, right? And, it, and I didn't want to make any make normative claims. But what I did want to make to, uh, is the distinction between processes which ride on perception action links and are mostly determined by associative history, so how many pairings of perception and action you had, and, and uh, processes in which are primarily uh, are determined by the meaning, right? Where associative history is almost irrelevant um, to these. So, I'm, so maybe the, the, the better distinction would be between associative versus reflexive processes, or, although it has its own problems. And Gerhard Gigerentz wrote huge articles about that thing. So, and the final thing is about the reflex, uh, how you don't like my no use of a useless reflex. But I do, there are, you know, in lots of disembodiment work where you study. Uh, people do actually look at these useless things, you know, useless activation. So, and a lot of argument in that literature, I simplified a lot of this, but this is actually goes back to a very serious disagreement in the literature about the, so like if I tell you the word hammer, you know, uh, you know, motor area is going to activate. Or if I show you the word, you know, uh, um, or, you know, if I show you a picture of a hammer, your hand area will activate. And many people say this has no functional meaning at all. This, 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 these data mean nothing. You know, people write about these data, get very excited, but these are just byproduct of just uh, pairing the picture of a hammer with uh, a movement of the hammer. And these are really useless kind of byproducts of, of, of perception action links. And my point was saying that they might be useless in the sense that they might be created, they might be accidents, but they, that there is a way of exploiting them for other purposes. Thanks.